Greetings and salutations, Geo Nerds. Um, this is a new series. Each week I plan to release an audio book of chapters from Tom Petrie's Reminiscences of Early Queensland. Um, this was written by his daughter Constance Campbell Petrie in 1904 when Tom was an old man and not long for this world as he, he died in 1910 at nearly 80 years old. She was 42 when she wrote these chapters. Unfortunately, Constance was not well either and died on the 4th of July 1926. So this week, chapter four. And you might as well know everything in this video is read by an AI reader, including this, uh, so sleep well, pilgrims. Let's, Let's rock. rock. The Reminiscences of Tom Petrie Before going further, it is necessary for me to tell you something of a Turwand or a great man. Well, a Turwand was one who was supposed to be able to do anything. He could fly, kill, cure or dive into the ground and come out again where and when he liked. He could bring or stop rain and so on, all by means of the Kundry, a small crystal stone, which he made the jinns and others believe he carried about inside him being able to bring it up at will by a string and swallow again, but my father has seen these stones and they were really carried in small grass dillies under the arm and were attached, with bees waxed to a string made from opossum hair. These stones were generally obtained from deep pools where they were dived for. The natives believed in a personality they, called Tagan, inadvertently spelt Targan in Dr. Roth's bulletin number five who seemed to be the spirit of the rainbow, and he it was who was responsible for these stones or crystals. Wherever the end of the rainbow touched the water, there they said crystals would be found, they knew where to dive for them. Several men possessing these stones belonged to every tribe. They were never young men, but those who had been through many fights and had had experience. Each one was noted for something special. For instance, one was a man who could bring thunder, another could cure, and so on. Whenever there was a storm or a flood, the Aborigines always blamed a Turwan of another tribe for sending it. Supposing the storm came from the north, it was a Turwan from a tribe in the north who was responsible, or if from the south, they blamed a southern tribe. When anyone was ill, he was taken to a Turwan to be cured, and the latter would make believe that he sucked a stone from the sick person's body, saying that was the cause of the mischief, another Turwan of another tribe having put it into him. For whenever anyone was ill, no matter under what circumstances, a stranger, Turwan Tanti, or rather his spirit, had most surely seen the afflicted one and thrown the Kundri at him, and a spirit could fly and thus do damage on a man miles away. If found out too late, nothing could save him. Aborigines do not believe they ever die a natural death. Then death is always caused through a Turwan of another tribe, when a man dies, they think that at some previous time he has been killed before without its being known. To anyone, even himself, verily a strange belief, they think he was killed with the Kundri and cut up into pieces, then put together again, afterwards dying by catching a cold or perhaps being killed in a fight. The man who killed him then is never blamed for the deed. He had to die, you see but they blame a man from another tribe for the real cause of death and do their best to be revenged. This causes all their big fights. They manage to decide on the murderer. Now I will tell you again. If anyone was ill in camp and a falling star was seen, there would be a great crying and lamenting. To the natives, it was a sign that the sick one was doomed. The star was the fire stick of the Turwan, which he dropped as he flew away after doing the mischief. Talking of how the Aborigines regard death, brings us to their burial customs. Whenever the death of an Aboriginal took place, all friends and relatives would gather together and cry, 
each man cutting his head with a tomahawk or jobbing it with a spear, till the blood ran freely down his body, and the old women did the same thing with yam sticks, while the young gins cut their thighs with sharp pieces, flintstone till their legs were covered with blood. In the meantime, a couple of men would get some sheets of tea tree bark on which to place the body, and if the corpse was not to be eaten, it would be wrapped up in this bark and tied round and round with string made from the inside of wattle bark. The feet were always left exposed, then two old men would carry the body. Those mourning following behind continually crying all the time, you could hear their cry a long way off. They would go some distance till they came to a tree, generally in a gully out of sight with a fork in the stem, six or eight feet from the ground. Here they would pause and seek about for two suitable forked sticks to match this tree. And these they fixed in the ground at a little distance from it, making the forks correspond in height with that of the tree. Next two sticks, cut about seven feet long, would be placed from the forked sticks to the tree fork, and from this three-cornered foundation a platform would be made with sticks, put across and bound with a wattle bark string. All being ready, the body would be lifted up onto this platform, which, without fail, would be made so that when the head was placed next, the tree the feet would point always towards the west. After this, a space in the ground underneath the body, about four feet square, would be cleared bare of grass, and at one side of it, a small fire would be built. This was that the spirit of the dead man might come down in the night and warm himself at the fire or cook his food. If the body was that of a man, a spear or waddy would be placed ready so that the spirit might go hunting in the night. If a woman then a yamstick took the place of the other weapon and her spirit could also hunt or dig for roots, these weapons were left that the spirits might obtain food. It was not supposed that they would ever fight. After finishing these preparations, the blacks would go away lamenting and the body was left in peace. Then the day after burial, if it could be called burial, an old tour one would go without the knowledge of the others, back to where this platform stood erect with its burden, and stealthily he would print on the cleared ground beneath a mark like a footprint with the palm of his hand. After his departure, two women, old women, near relatives of the deceased, a mother and her sister, if alive, would appear on the scene. They, of course, would see this mark, and at once would imagine that the murderer had been the and left his footprint behind him. Strange to say too, they would recognize to whom the footprint belonged. So back they went to the others and told them all who was the murderer. It was generally someone they had a spite against in another tribe and there would be no question or doubt. After that, no one went near the body till the flesh had dropped off when two old women relatives again went and taking it down, they would proceed to separate the bones from each other. Certain of these were always religiously put aside and kept. They were the skull, leg, arm and hip bones, while those of the ribs and back, etc. were burnt. The bones kept were put in a dilly and so carried to the camp. And this dilly, with its sacred contents, accompanied the old woman relative on all her wanderings for months after. Wards. In the meantime, however, the following happened. At the camp, a fire would be made some 50 or 100 yards from the huts, and all hands were coloured to come and witness the performance. The bones were clean-ed and rubbed with charcoal, and one of the old gins who discovered the murderer's footmark would sit in the middle. The rest sur rounding her, and she would take the hip bones and, with a stone tomahawk, would chop them. Accompanying each chop with the name of some black of another tribe sung in a chanting fashion. Now and again the bone would crack and each time it did this, the woman happened to call the name of the man she had told them of, who had left his footprint behind on the cleared ground, and the rest would exchange glances, saying he must be the guilty party. Father has been present on these occasions and the blacks would always draw his attention to the unquestionableness of the conclusion arrived at. Nothing could persuade them that it was not fair and should they come across the poor unfortunate singled out his death, was a certainty. Perhaps some night he would be curled up asleep in the dark when suddenly he was pounced upon and put out of existence, or perhaps he would be innocently engaged at some occupation when a dark form sneaking up behind him would send a spear through his skull or otherwise do the deed. A death always roused great desire for revenge and the friends of the deceased would watch and plan in every way till at last their end was accomplished. And even when revenge like this 
many a big fight took place over a death. For the tribe to which the dead man had belonged would send a challenge to the tribe of the man held responsible for the deed by two messengers carrying a stick marked with notches cut in it. This stick served to show that there were a great number of blacks and that they were in earnest. The messengers suggested a place of meeting for the fight and after staying perhaps a week would return to their friends who would look forward to the affray. I've spoken of the blacks as cannibals, mentioning that it was only ordinary men and women of no condition who were buried. Here is how a cannibal feast would be proceeded with. First, the body was carried about a mile away from the camp and there placed on sheets of tea tree bark near a fire. I may mention that it was a practice with the Aboriginal to keep his body, minus the head, free from hair by singeing himself with a torch. It was similar to the habit of shaving. Should an Aboriginal be unsinged, he was unkempt, as a white man is who has not shaved. He could do his own arms and hands, etc., but would ask the assistance of others for the back, the singeing over. He rubbed his body with charcoal and grease, feeling then beautifully clean and nice. So perhaps it was this habit which made the Aborigines singe their dead for the last time before devouring them. A Turwantuk would take a piece of dry sapwood from an old tree and lighting it well by the fire would keep knocking off the red ashes till it burnt with a flame like a candle. With this, he would give the body an extra good singeing all over, accepting the head until the skin turned from black to a light brown colour. Then the body would be rubbed free of any singe particles and turned face downwards and three or four men, who had been solemnly standing at some distance from the others, would slowly advance one by one, singing a certain tune to the Bodhi. Each of these men held a shell or stone knife in his hand, and the first would start by slitting the skin open from the head down the neck, then retiring. His place would be taken by the second man, who would carry the opening on down the body, the third man down the legs and so on, till the skin was opened right to the heels and would peel off in one whole piece. During all this performance, never a joke nor a laugh was heard, but everything was carried out with the utmost quietude and solemnity. The body would be cut up when skinned, and the whole tribe sitting round in groups in a circle, each group possessing a fire would watch expectantly for their share of the dainty. One can imagine how they would look forward to the feast as time advanced, and doubtless they watched with hungry eyes as the old men divided out the flesh in pieces to each lot. Immediately on grabbing their portion, each group would roast and devour it, and in no time, all was over and done. The heart and waist parts would be buried in a hole dug alongside the fire, and this interesting hole was marked by three sticks driven into the ground, standing about a foot high and bound round with grass rope. The hair, ears, nose, and the toes and fingers without the bones would be left on the skin, which was hung on two spears before a fire to dry. Sometimes it would take some time to dry and would have to be spread out each day. Then when ready, it would be blackened with charcoal and grease. After that, the skin was folded up and put into a dilly, and so carried everywhere by a relative with the certain bones that were kept. These remains were always carried by a woman relative, who kept them for six months or so when she tired of the burden, or there was a fresh one ready to carry. And so a hollow tree or a cave in a rock was used as a depository. When my father came to North Pine, there was a hollow gum tree near where he settled, full of skins and bones of the dead. This tree was burnt by bushfires. So, though part of it may still be seen, there is, of course, no trace of anything exciting in the way of remains. A tree used in this way was considered sacred or dim mangali, and no one dared trifle with its contents. The remains were not just thrown into the hollow, but must be carefully left in dillies, and thus hung on forked sticks in the tree. A hollow tree was looked for with a hole in the trunk several feet from the ground. It must not open right down, or else a hollow one with no opening would be cut out as desired. The idea was to place the forked sticks in the earth so that they stood upright with the bags hanging on them. When my father was quite a boy, he was sent once to look for some strayed cows to York's Hollow, the present Brisbane exhibition ground, which was all wild bush and was a great fighting ground for the blacks. At the time of which I speak, the blacks were all camped there. And when young Tom arrived on the scene, he came across an old gin crying and going up to her asked what was the matter. 
The woman replied that her naring, Ita's son, had been killed and pulling an opossum skin covering from her dilly displayed his skin. It made the boy start to see the hair of the head and beard, the fingers, etc., all on the skin, and going home, he told grandfather about it. The latter offered flour, tea, sugar, tobacco, a tomahawk, anything for the skin. But the old woman would not part with it. Her husband, man-like, was more willing, however, and after some weeks turned up with a nice little new dilly containing four pieces of his son's skin, two from the breast and two from the back. And this he presented to Tom for his father. The scars or markings could be seen on these pieces, which were as thick almost as a bullock's hide. The old black fellow took pride in giving this present, and later, so honouring Tom, called him his son. And all the tribe looked upon the boy as such. And from that time forth, he was considered a great man, or Turwan, no one saying him nay, but doing anything for him and letting him know all their secrets. It got to be known all over the place from tribe to tribe that he had been presented with portions of Yabba's son's skin, and so he was received everywhere with open arms, as it were, for Yabba was well known and respected. Women relatives of a dead person possessing a skin might give small portions from the back or breast to their friends of other tribes when meeting them. The receivers would lament again over the skin when in their own camp, but having been given this, they felt quite safe about their men relations visiting the tribe of the deceased, for this giving of skin meant that the recipient was not connected in any way with suspicion. The bodies of children were never skinned, they were placed up on trees unless in extra good condition, when they would be eaten. Very young children or babies were roasted whole, and women generally ate them. In some instances, babies were killed at birth and then eaten by the old women, for instance, if the mother died, for they blamed the child. Cripples or deformed people were met with often enough among the Aborigines, some with withered limbs, and these were invariably treated kindly, as indeed were also all old people. Aborigines would live to be 70 or 80 years of age, and if at any time they were unable to fend for themselves, their relatives took them in hand, treating them with great respect and veneration. However, at death, the bodies of cripples were just shoved anyhow into hollow logs. An Aboriginal camp was always shifted immediately whenever a death took place, and the trees round about where a native had died or where he had been eaten would be nicked as a sign of what had taken place. Well, folks, you know, that's chapter... Uh, more soon, you know, so keep rocking and T-Rock's out. <laughs>